Uh, okay, everyone, what's up? Goldie here. And I'm going to be going over the big 14-game main slate uh, that we have here on Tuesday, uh, June 13. Um, frozen here in the sheet already. It's a good start. Um, we, as you can see, big flashing red box. Don't have a, an announced starter for Texas just yet. That's really the only... Um, kind of missing piece of the uh, of the puzzle here so far. We do have projections and ownership loaded to the site already. Um, so feel free to peruse those and start building your teams um, at your earliest convenience. So a lot of games. Let's just get into it and dispense with all of the pleasantries. Eh? Uh, we'll start with uh, Toronto and Baltimore here. Chris Bassett on the mound for the Jays. 9,000. Not super stoked about this price, to be quite honest. Um, for Bassett, he's really struggling with left-handers giving up power this season. Not so much in average, just 250 there. That's a fine number. 378 Woba, however, buoyed a little bit by a 10.5, 11% walk rate to the left side. But a 289 ISO to lefties. Uh, it mostly because he's still mainlining a, a two-seamer here. Cutter hasn't really been all that great, um, and not generating a lot of whiffs, just 21.5% K rate to the left side. 2.4 homers per nine, pretty noisy there, I think. And admittedly, a, a pretty high ISO at 289. This will probably come down, because he is still throwing a you know break-even cutter here, and he's got plus change-up value. Uh, so far this season. However, in aggregate, just a 10% swinging strike rate, 27% CSW is not all that impressive, really, for a guy at 9,000. A whip hovering right at one um, is a little kind of notable as well. It's not because he's going to, you know, be susceptible to, susceptible to walking a lot of people, just a 6% walk rate uh, here against the right-handers. But as I mentioned, 11% walk rate against the lefties with some hard contact, slightly elevated, nothing terrible, 32% against the left side, but 080 ground ball to fly ball. So he's on the barrel a little bit more to the lefties, and that makes him a little bit attackable here. So I think this is kind of a dangerous matchup. Um, really no good four-seamer value for him, and like I said, the cutters just kind of break even here. So not generating as much soft contact and ground balls as he'd liked uh, with the you know, the the cutter uh, in particular, and certainly throwing a two-seamer as your main fastball pitch, full 40% of the arsenal. Against opposite-handed hitters, we talk about this all the time, not all that equitable, equitable a pitch, and certainly not a whiff pitch. Um, so I'm probably going to end up leaving Bassett on the shelf. There's a lot of guys in the 9K range I think we're far more comfortable getting to. Um, you know, we'll get to all of those guys as we do, but so I'm probably going to leap Bassett off here today. Uh, I think from the Orioles, if we want to go after Bassett, uh, Gunnar Henderson, he's been fantastic recently. Third and shortstop eligibility now. 3,600, he's likely going to lead off, and he's really starting to come into his own from the plate. So uh, I, I think he's I mean, certainly price adjusted. He's the best play from the O's. I uh, really like him tonight a lot. He'll probably see a little bit of ownership, but, um, you know, I... I don't really care. It's 14 game slate. We can find plenty of places to get different if necessary. Uh, Rutch also a very good play from the left side. 5,400, kind of stiff for a catcher, of course, on a full 14 gamer. And Anthony Santander at 46, not the greatest price. Um, and we kind of like him a little bit better from the right side, but certainly playable still. If you need to get to a cheaper Ryan O'Hearn or even an Aaron Hicks, I guess. Um, they're okay plays on a 14 gamer though. I'm probably going to end up leaving those guys on the shelf because hitting in the middle and bottom half of a lineup, uh, against a pretty good arm at home on a full slate like this, um, you, you sacrifice some equity when there's so many other guys that you can play and, and consider getting to. So probably going to leave most of those guys on the shelf outside of Gunner, some Rutch and some Santander. That's certainly the favorite uh, little short stack from the Orioles. Dean Kramer on the mound for the Birds. 7,500 for him. Uh, also going to leave him on the shelf. Really bad matchup here. We talked about this a couple of times with Dean Kramer. He's just pitching to way too much contact and too much power here. 
right? 34% to the righties, 40% hard contact to the lefties, giving up a 175 ISO to the left side, 183 to the righties here. 321 average to left-handers this year is a really big number. Strikeout rates to both sides, sub 20%. And about a neutral ground ball to fly ball. He's not going to walk people, just a 6% aggregate walk rate. But he's on the barrel here at a 10.5% clip. He's going to throw it over the plate and make you hit it. And without a lot of chase at just 24%, it's really just kind of an unimpressive 10% swing strike rate, strike rate with a 25-26% CSW here. Um, middling and upper 4 ZRA with expected metrics mostly in the same sort of range. But very attackable contact figures here, and at a neutral ground ball to fly ball, I think you can go after this, certainly with a very high contact team in Toronto. Uh, you can play some of the lefties, you can play some of the righties as well. It's pricing that's really going to prevent us from getting a lot of Toronto, I think. But they're a very valuable stack here today. 114 WRC plus against righties, 34% hard. 170 ISO is leaving it on the table a little bit for the quality of this lineup or quality of the individual pieces in the lineup, 21% aggregate K rate, there's the high contact. They're going to hit for a, a decent bit of of hard and, and, and very loud contact here at medium, medium plus, very little soft. As a team aggregate, just 15% soft contact. So uh, very difficult lineup to get through with a below average arm, and that's certainly what Dean Kramer is. Not impressed with most of the arsenal. Um He's only going to go about five innings here, and at 7,500, we'd like him probably 6,500. I think that makes him a little bit more of an intriguing tournament play. But this is a bad matchup. I think we can get to some Toronto as well. Probably just short stacks again, because I think Dalton Varsho just stinks. Uh, but you can play him. He's 3,500. He'll be in the five-hold. No power from Witt. No power from Ali Kirk behind the plate. Um, if you need to get cheap with it, because Springer, Bichette, Vladdy, Matt Chapman at the top, the guys who you really want to play are kind of expensive. You can play Nathan Lukes. He's a stone min at 2,000, or even a wraparound. Kevin Biggio has got dual eligibility, second base, and outfield here at 2,200. So you can get to some full stacks of Toronto. Uh, I think they're a good tournament stack because they certainly have upside to hit the baseball over the wall. Matt Chapman, I think, is probably my favorite price-adjusted play here uh, from the right side. Vladdy Guerrero, you can always play him. Bo Bichette, not my favorite at 54 at shortstop today. And Springer, he's okay, too, at 5,000 flat um, in this particular matchup. So I think I'd rather get to maybe just some one-offs, to be honest. Um, those would be my favorites, but I think full stacks are certainly in play here for the Jays, more so than the Orioles. I'd prefer just short stacks for them against Bassett. I respect, certainly respect Bassett uh, a good bit more than Dean Kramer. Okay, let's move on. Yankees and the Mets at City Field in the Subway Series. Severino on the mound at 7,100. He's been not great, right? He's had a couple of serviceable outings here in his first four starts, um, and he's also gotten blasted a couple of times. So he was fine against San Diego, and he was serviceable in his first outing against Cincinnati, going four and two thirds against the Reds and six and two thirds against the Padres. Um, leaving a little bit on the table with the strikeout stuff here at just five strikeouts in each of those games. Then he got bludgeoned by the Dodgers, went just four innings, struck out just two, and gave up seven earned on nine hits. And it wasn't all that much better against White Sox in his following outing. This was his last start, struck out six in five innings, gave up four runs against White Sox. So he's struggling to kind of find it here a little bit. He's throwing a lot of strike one. The problem is his fastball command. He's not able to locate and establish early in the count here. And the four-seamer slider has really not been good so far. He can't take a lot out of the values or whatever. Uh, but that's how he's getting hit hard here, right on the barrel with a lot of this contact. And as we can see, the contact rate's very, very high. They'll come down, of course. And this is an okay matchup to see a little bit of that regression um, against the Mets because this offense is bad. However, they don't strike out a lot, and if Seve is struggling to kind of throw it past people here, just a 20% aggregate K rate so far, uh, I think he's likely to struggle a little bit more. Ballpark plays up pitching, of course, but um, I still, on a, on a full 14-game state, am not sure that I want to be going after 
uh, a really sticky offense over here. Um, favorite plays from the Mets, probably going to be Brandon Nimmo, 4,100 leading off. You can always play Frankie Lindor. He's 47, though. Um, not super jacked about that, but it's okay. And then I'd probably mix in whoever they've got in the two-hole uh, or the three-hole. Not jacked about playing Jeff McNeil in the three at second base uh, on a full 14-game slate. Frankie Alvarez, if he's in the two, though, at 3,800, think this is okay. Probably don't want to get too much more crazy than that. Uh, but if you want to attack some of this early season variance with Severino, I think this is okay going after the Mets. They're well down the list, I think, because I still respect Severino to kind of get it right. Um, you know, but a, a piece here or there, it's it's not terrible. Scherzer on the mound at uh, 9,800 for the Mets. Um, yeah, he's going to be very chalky, and I think you can maybe get off of this a little bit. At 33% ownership, this is pretty heavy for a starting pitcher. Um and Scherzer really, like, over this last several starts, admittedly been figuring it out a little bit. Uh, however, he's still kind of enigmatic, right? In his last outing against Atlanta, he got picked apart a little bit. Struck out 10. That was great. Gave up five runs. That uh, was not great. Sprayed 11 hits. Really not great. Uh, previous two outings against attackable lineups, Philly and Colorado. Strikeout stuff was there. The depth was there going seven innings in each of those starts. So I think he's figuring it out a little bit, uh, much more than Verlander. But um, I think this is a fine spot for Scherzer to go after some of the Yankees, but not a spot where you necessarily have to eat a full 30% ownership. you got a ton of arms that you can play here today. Uh, a lot of guys in this 9K range, as I mentioned. So do you have to eat 98 and 30 per plus percent ownership on Scherzer? Not necessarily. Now, the Yankees are obviously still missing Judge. Um, and without their best hitter, this lineup is, uh, well, they're going to be on the downside of the run creation here. Um, strikeout rate's probably going to go down because Judge does strike out, certainly against right-handed pitching. But they got Stanton and Donaldson back, who all strike out a lot. Jake Bauer's going to whiff, too, in the middle of the lineup. So, Glaber, Willie Calhoun, not so much at the top. Might make it a little bit sticky, certainly trying to get through Anthony Rizzo as well in the three-hole uh, for Scherzer here. So I think it's it's viable if you want to get to a 4,200 Anthony Rizzo. I think it's a pretty damn good price for him, to be quite honest. Even though the average isn't there anymore and he's not a Yankee Stadium, I think it's still a fine and attackable price tag of 42 there. Uh, if I want to get some leverage stacks against Scherzer, it'd be a Willie Calhoun. Don't really want to pay 52 for Glaber in this particular matchup. Um, or a full price 49 for, for uh, Stanton, rather. So I think it'd probably just be like one-offs of the lefties uh, or a short three-man, maybe a Willie Calhoun, Anthony Rizzo, Jake Bowers type. Um, if we need to get to some other expensive stacks or arms, that sort of construction could make that happen for you. Don't really want to go after Scherzer. However, I mean, he's a fly ball pitcher, and he's a stone lock to give up a dinger pretty much every start here. Uh, and he has been he's been this way for uh, a pretty long time. But throwing a lot of strike one here, really getting ahead of hitters. And that's why with just kind of, you know, average change in curveball value here so far, he's still able to work uh, to those pitches in the counts he wants to throw them. So because he's establishing, you know, with a, a, the four seamer and the cutter early in the count. So um, now this season, he's been a little bit more susceptible to the right handers, which would put some of them in play. But historically, it's been lefties that you mostly want to go after Scherzer with and mostly lefty home run power. So, um, did, like, the guy's freaking 58 years old here, so these numbers are not necessary. He's not going to become a reverse split arm all of a sudden uh, at this point in his career. So, uh, if you want to go after him, he's got a 10% barrel rate. It's not nothing. And he's a fly ball pitcher that gives up some hard contact in the air. So, that's fine. And you can come off of some of this 30% ownership. You don't have to be too scared on a full 14 gamer of fading Scherzer here. Um, so mostly off of offense here because the offenses really aren't that, all that good. Kind of respect the arms. And yeah, I'm interested in Scherzer, but um, I'll probably come in underweight to that 30% ownership, to be honest. All right, let's move on. Colorado and Boston. Chase Anderson on the mound. Man, Connor Seabold was really, really good last night. Uh, kind of frustrating if you had a, a lot of Boston, of course, but... Um, that was really good to see Connor Siebold kind of taking a, a pretty big leap. And with these couple of arms here, similar to Chase Anderson, they've been very serviceable. Um, not so much like a Denelson Lamette, but with all these kids filling in for the uh, kids, um, uh, with all these guys filling in for the other guys that have, that have been hurt in the rotation, it's actually 
keeping Colorado in a lot of baseball games and allowing their offense and their young hitters to get a lot of really uh, important at bats. We've seen guys like Nolan Jones, Z Tovar, um, you know, who else? Uh, Brenton Doyle get a lot of uh, really important kind of high leverage at bats. Uh, and that's good for the Rockies going forward. Perhaps not tonight. Um, with Chase Anderson on the mound, eh, he's likely to, you know, similar to Siebold last night, get picked apart pretty good because this is still Boston. This is still a pretty damn good offense. However, Chase Anderson, um, you know, Boston's going to platoon very heavily here tonight. They're going to have probably six lefties in the lineup at least, um, depending on what they want to do down at the bottom. And Chase Anderson's actually a reverse split guy. He's always been a reverse split guy, and that's mostly because he's always had a really, really good changeup. That hasn't changed, so to speak, uh, this season. He's introduced a cutter. He's throwing this a lot now, too, and getting a lot of value out of it. Um, uh, uh, the entire four-seam sinker-cutter fastball mix here, it's been very equitable for him um, so far this season in his few starts, and he's suppressed a lot of production. With the really good changeup and the pretty good cutter, I think it's okay if you also come off of Boston again tonight. Now, we mentioned this yesterday that Seabold had enough in the tank to suppress there a little bit, and sure enough, he had a really, really good outing. I think Chase Anderson is, you know, I, I see a lot of similarities there here in the arsenal. Of course, he's very attackable. Don't get me wrong. He's going to pitch to a lot of contact still, but he's got a low barrel rate similar to Seabold and a low walk rate similar to Seabold. It's the strikeout rate and the contact rates that are really going to be super worrisome. Uh, he's, of course, got a very low ERA with expected metrics far higher, very high strand rate here. So we're expecting some regression to come to him eventually. But that doesn't mean that he still can't survive like a five innings and keep Austin off the board here a little bit with these really, really good two-pitch arsenal here uh, with cutter and changeup neutralizing a lot of these lefties. So I think it's very reasonable if you come off of some Boston here tonight, like you can play Devers against everybody, good changeup or not, doesn't really matter. You can play Yoshida against everybody, good changeup or not, doesn't really matter. But I'm mostly off of Verdugo, mostly off of Jaron Duran. Like Jaron Duran's 3,600, he's going to lead off. That's fine. But I'm not sure I want to stack a bunch of lefties against Chase Anderson here tonight. I really respect his pitch, um, this changeup in particular, and the cutter as well. So if you want to get to... Uh, Somebody, I think my favorite, would probably be Justin Turner, 3,400. He lost his third base eligibility, so that really stinks. But he's still a damn good hitter, and he still makes a lot of contact, doesn't strike out a lot. So he'll be in the middle of the lineup, most likely. Um, and I think that's a fine play. So probably just one-offs and short stacks with like a Devers, Duran, Justin Turner, something like that. For me... Boston's still coming in very heavy ownership here tonight, and I am not sure it's totally warranted. Um, so I don't know. I'll probably come in under on Boston rather than just click in a bunch of guys and, and go after Chase Anderson here. Just respect the arsenal. Uh, Cutter Crawford on the mound. I'd like to get to a couple Rockies pieces if I can, particularly from the left side, Nolan Jones, Ryan McMahon, uh, maybe a Mike Mustaka, something like that. Don't really want to play Jerry Profar, but he's leading off, gets a lot of at-bats, and he's got a very high on base streak, I believe. I believe it's still intact. In any case, 3,800 for him, not super jacked about that. But Nolan Jones, Ryan McMahon, they're the guys that have power. I'd rather get to them if I can. However, 38 for Nolan Jones. I mean, that's okay. He's been really seeing the baseball. Ryan McMahon also still really seeing the baseball, 4,700. Cutter Crawford's been mega attackable with left-handers this season. 240 ISO allowed. Does have a very high strikeout rate, but it's kind of noisy there in 81 hitters seen. 34% hard contact with an 050 ground ball to fly ball. So he's going to get on the barrel a little bit to the left-handers in particular. That's because his, his off-speed pitch, it's a break-even split. He does throw a cutter, so that's going to suppress a lot of the contact. He does actually get some whiffs with this pitch and induces soft at a full 26%. So I'm not jacked about playing the Colorado lefties here, nor am I super excited about playing the Colorado righties. Um... But I think some short sacks are in play because Cutter Crawford is unlikely to be stretched out in his last few outings. He's only gone, what, two and, what, three innings in his last couple appearances. So he's probably got, like, a max of four in the tank, which means you can't really play him um, against a low upside offense over here in the Rockies. So I think they're a very off-the-board tournament sort of short stack. Not crazy about the price tags. 
Uh, but I think a couple of these guys are certainly in play if you um, if you want to go after a little bit of Cutter Crawford and, and just like a, a short stack or something. Okay, let's move on. Milwaukee and Minnesota. Corbin Burns on the mound. I like this. 9900 Um, I'm kind of lukewarm on the price. However, I, I think the ownership is good. And if you want to pivot off of Scherzer, this is how I would prefer to do it. You're seeing, what, 40% or 60% of the ownership uh, you're seeing on Scherzer. Um, so I think this is fine, really because... Minnesota's over here going to platoon very heavily against him tonight. They got a lot of lefties, and they're probably only going to put two, maybe three, possibly four righties, depending on what they do in the outfield, uh, in the lineup against him tonight. And, you know, the two of these righties are going to be down at the bottom, and they're like Ryan Jeffers or Christian Vasquez and like Michael Taylor. Um, historically, haven't hit righties all that well anyway. It's Corbin Burns' cutter here that is a really, really good pitch. It's a cutter change combination. In even getting a lot of whiffs and, and good equity out of the curveball here against the left side of the plate. So he's a full-on reverse split guy this season. 158 average allowed to the lefties. 216 Woba with an 058 ISO and a 26% K rate. These are elite figures here. 23% soft and just a 21% hard contact rate to left-handers. 2.2 ground balls per fly ball. It's just absolutely fantastic against the lefties. And like I said, Minnesota's going to have at least five lefties in there, probably six or more. So I don't really want to be dealing with much of Minnesota. If I'm going to play anybody, it's going to be Carlos Correa at 4,100 or maybe, maybe, maybe a Royce Lewis at 35. Possibly a catcher piece, only if they're hitting in like the five hole or something, which isn't going to happen. So uh, mostly just a one-off here like as some coverage against Corbin Burns. Because I like this here, and I like the lower ownership compared to Scherzer. I think it's a better batted ball matchup with, um, for what Minnesota is likely to throw at him. I'm not super thrilled about the price tag necessarily, but he's definitely got the upside. Unfortunately, he went a full eight innings and um, had a really good outing in his last appearance against uh, Baltimore and struck out nine. He's done that a couple of times this year, and immediately after those outings, I usually like coming off of pitchers because – those types of outings are not fully sustainable long term, right? He's not going to go eight innings, strike out 10 every damn start. Um, and this is still an okay lineup against right handed pitching in general. They're probably going to get Joey Gallo back here tonight, et cetera, et cetera. They hit for a little bit of power. We saw them take apart Kevin Gosman the other night, for example. So um, still a major league list, and they can still get to him if he's not fully spotting and, and really cutting this cutter, so to speak. Um, in on the hands against left-handers and inducing all of this soft contact. If he's over the barrel a little bit, he can get picked apart. But for the most part, he's not going to walk people, and he stays off of the barrel. So I like Corbin Burns here uh, a pretty decent bit. Um, and I think, at least as of now, not necessarily price-adjusted, but certainly ownership-adjusted, he's my preference to Scherzer. Pablo Lopez on the other mound, uh, on the same mound on the other side. Uh, for the Twins, 8,800. Like, if I had to choose between these two guys, I'd rather just play Pablo because I think Milwaukee is worse. I think Pablo is pretty much... Uh, I mean, he's just as serviceable as Corbin Burns. Not necessarily as good. I think the strikeout stuff for him... I mean, that's definitely better, right, to both sides of the plate. Um, and doesn't have all that outsized a split necessarily compared to Corbin Burns. For example, Corbin Burns got 185 ISO to righties with 36% hard contact and an 060 ground ball to fly ball. Right, That's a huge, huge split between his lefty numbers and his righty numbers. Pablo, on the other hand, he's a neutral ground ball to fly ball guy to both sides of the plate with far reduced hard contact rates to both sides, hovering right at 30%. K rates there... 23% right at average against lefties, 33% against the right side. So um, now the Brewers, they're going to throw some lefties in here, but it's not going to be all that many, to be quite honest. They're going to have Luis Urias and Brian Anderson in the list. Same with Owen Miller, and Willie Contreras behind the plate, almost certainly. Willie Adamas are not going to sit. And Joey Weimer down at the bottom, he's been very hot recently. They're not going to sit him either, right? So they're going to have probably just Yelich, Rowdy, Telez, maybe a John Singleton at first base or something in there from the left side, which I think makes Pablo Lopez here very much playable at 8,800. Now, the ownership is starting to drift upward here. I'm less enthused about eating 30% ownership on Pablo. Um, but if I had to choose between these, these two guys, 
the ownership's mostly similar. Projection's basically the same. But Pablo is 1100 cheaper, and I think the matchup is a little bit better going after Milwaukee in aggregate because the offense here for the Brewers is a little bit worse than it is for the Twins. K rates, not so much. You know, they're high, which is why both of these pitchers are, are certainly in play. So mostly pitching here for me, if I had to get to a lefty from the Twins, excuse me, from the Brewers, uh, against Pablo, it would probably be Yelich. I'm not really jacked about playing 4,400 rally to Les necessarily. Um, I certainly don't want to play a John Singleton, even if he is the stone min at 2,000 at sole first base. No, thank you uh, on a 14 gamer. So probably just one off piece here or there, but very minimal exposures. I like pitching uh, almost exclusively in this game. Let's move on to San Francisco and St. Louis. Um, Alex Cobb on the mound, 8,500. Yeah. And I, I think this makes him a really good tournament play. Um, not necessarily the price tag. It's mostly the ownership here at sub-5%. I think he has upside, certainly, against what's likely to be a pretty righty-heavy lineup. Cardinals are going to throw at him tonight. Um, they've only got, what, three lefties, one of which you're really kind of scared of, and Nolan Gorman. Um, they're likely to lead off Brendan Donovan, and they'll have Dylan Carlson in there, maybe a Tommy, probably a Tommy Edmond down at the bottom, but you're not really scared of him from the left side necessarily. So I have four lefties, but mostly pretty right-handed heavy here at um, at five righties in there with Goldschmidt, Arenado, Contreras, Jordan Walker, Paul DeYoung. Now, the, the, the top two guys, right, Goldschmidt, Arenado, they're very good hitters against righties anyway. Um, however, it's the ground ball stuff that really has me concerned here when clicking in a bunch of the Cardinals. I think they're fine because these guys are still good hitters, and Brendan Donovan's cheap enough with dual eligibility leading off 2,900 that you can play him. Dylan Carlson's 2,400. He's a switch hitter in the middle of the lineup. You could play him. Um, and you can play Goldschmidt and Arenado against literally everybody in baseball. That's fine. So I think Cardinal stacks are in play, uh, but I, I think Alex Cobb is also in play here. He has really, really good stuff against right-handers. 261 average allowed to pitch to a little bit of contact, but it's mostly on the ground here, 36% hard contact. He's got a 2.5 ground ball to fly ball ratio against the right side of the plate with a 30% strikeout rate. So I'm not super worried uh, about you know playing Alex Cobb against a pretty righty-heavy lineup. It's mostly the lefties where we kind of balk a little bit, 14% strikeout rate. With a 293 average allowed, but just an 050 ISO because once again, 320 ground ball to fly ball ratio against the left side of the plate. So far fewer whiffs against the lefties uh, and more contact there. That's why I think if we are going to play somebody, it puts Brendan Donovan and Nolan Gorman, Dylan Carlson in play. Um, however, it's, just, it's still really, really hard to get through a 3 0 ground ball to fly ball ratio no matter who you are. So, um, Alex Cobb control is is always been there, stays off the barrel. 68% strike one, 31% chase, all really good numbers. Strand rate probably pretty high here at 81 and 82%. So if we're going to see a little bit of regression, that's probably where it's going to come. I'm a little fishy on this 8,500 price tag for him, but I think he's in play in tournaments if you land on this. You don't need to get a hell of a lot of exposure to him to get some leverage on the field. And he has upside for 30, even in this kind of difficult strikeout matchup. Cardinals only 21% in aggregate, and they create a little bit 108 WRC plus with some hard contact against the righties. But it's mostly the ground ball stuff that keeps him in play and the high strikeout rate against the right side. Flaherty on the mound for the Cardinals, 8,000. I just hate playing Jack Flaherty, man. I do not like this guy. He's so, so difficult to deal with because he walks the freaking bases loaded in the first inning every damn outing. He walked five guys in his last start. And he somehow survived for six innings or whatever the hell it was and struck out eight against Texas. I mean, it's insanely frustrating trying to play this guy because he, he can't throw freaking strikes early in his outings. And even later in his outings, he's still got the walk problems surfacing. So that really takes me off. I hate guys that cannot keep their pitch count down um, and give me some upside for more than five and a third per start. So at 8000 however, I think the price tag is okay here today. What's really kind of putting me on to this a little bit more is the ownership figure, sub 10%. I don't want to play guys that have high walk rates when they're very popular. But on a 14-gamer, we don't really have to worry about that, you know, all that much. And sub 10% puts him in play here because overall, despite my bias, 
Um, you know, the numbers are pretty respectable here, even though he's only got a 22.5% K rate against the left side, right? A lot of ground balls still, um, and the hard contact numbers are fine at, you know, 29% in aggregate, both, uh, or to both sides of the plate, they are below 30%. He'll give up a little bit more average to the lefties, and he walks more of them at 14.5% and a 273 average allowed, but still a buck 50 ground ball to fly ball to both sides. So it makes him serviceable. If it weren't for the damn walk rate, like this strikeout rate would be so much higher. He's having trouble getting ahead in counts. He just elevates his pitch count, so it makes it very difficult to play. But low ownership here, and in a playable price tag, playable projection, I think it puts him in play because the Giants are still going to strike out a lot here. So he's likely to see a little little bit of a spike in the strikeout variance to the upside for him in this particular matchup. However, they're going to walk a lot, full 10%. They're a patient team over here, and they will hit for power. So with a, a lower whiff rate to the lefties, I think that puts the Giants in play as well. Um, and in particular, Jock Peterson and uh, Mike, Mike Yastrzemski um, at 44 and 4,000, respectively. Not super thrilled about Lamont Wade at 47, but he didn't strike out a lot. That's okay. Tyro is fine, but he's 53, and I don't really want a righty against this, or in this particular matchup. Um, Michael Conforto, back healthy, it seems, at 4,500, also okay. So some, some giant stacks are in play, mostly just short stacks for me, I think. Um... But I think pretty much everybody here is in play to one degree or another. Kind of lukewarm on the game overall, uh, but that makes for an interesting tournament spot, I think. Okay, let's move on to Texas, or the Angels at Texas. Jaime Berea on the mount for the Angels, 7,300. Don't think we can really play this. Um, not that I'd really get excited about doing so anyway. I'm not going after pretty much anybody, or with anybody. I'm not going after Texas. Um, as I talked about yesterday, I think this is probably the most difficult lineup in baseball to get through top to bottom, and I'm certainly not going to do it with a, an average to below average arm in Jaime Berea. Uh, 24% aggregate K rate so far. It's a little bit noisy because he's got 11 appearances out of the bullpen this season. 61% strike one is fine. 28% chase rate is fine. 11 12% swing strike rate is fine. 29% CSW. Pretty damn good, to be quite honest. So he's serviceable and he's equitable, but not in this matchup. I'm not playing him. I think he'd need to be 6,300 for me to get, um, I mean, even kind of, you know, raise my eyebrows a little bit and and get slightly intrigued. Um, we don't have it as I announced at the uh, or mentioned at the uh, outset. We don't have an announced starter for Texas yet, so not sure what they're going to do. This was John Gray, but he got scratched yesterday with a blister. So. Um, they're probably going to have to call somebody up or just run a bullpen game here or something. So that kind of takes me off of the Angels a little bit here. Uh, depending on who it is, DK doesn't have anybody. Um, Fangrass doesn't have anybody. You know, a couple places around the industry are just like throwing up a random name or whatever. But uh, MLB hasn't announced anybody in, in um, officially yet. So that's, uh, I mean, we just got no idea. We're just going to have to wait and, and see what the Rangers want to do. Um, but you can always play Trout. You can always play Otani. Depending on who it is, if they throw a lefty out there, I'm more intrigued with the Taylor Ward, Anthony Rendon at cheap price tags, including a Brandon Drury, 43, still playable in dual eligibility, first and second base. Gio Urshela, 26 under first and third base. Very playable piece there if they throw, a, throw out a lefty, and he's in the lineup. Um, so I think Angel Stacks are in play here. Texas always. I don't really, you know, I, I'm going after Jaime here. Um and I'm going to have exposure to Texas literally every single day against every single starting pitcher in baseball. I don't really care who it is. Uh, and to be honest, like Corey Seager, 5,300, like this is a stone buy every single time he's in the low 5Ks, is a top 10 hitter in baseball. Everybody in the lineup got a price drop today outside of Josh Young, who's still just 4,600. So sign me up for some Texas once again, and they're always going to top or to pop in the top half of value um, really no matter – who they get on the mound. So, uh, yeah, sign me up for everybody, including the guys down at the bottom of the lineup. Zeke Duran hit a bomb last night. Uh, Robbie Grossman has really good upside hit tool from both sides of the plate. Jankowski, who knows what they're going to do with him. Um, and anybody in, in the top six, either catcher, like literally everybody is playable here. 
Okay, Pittsburgh and Chicago. Uh, we probably get through this pretty quickly. They're probably going to postpone this game. Um, they get a lot of rain come through Chicago here today, and they're very unlikely to be able to get this game in. So um, don't be surprised we see in the next couple hours that they just call this. This is a, a division game, so they're going to have a chance later on in the season. Um or even perhaps tomorrow or, or Thursday. I'm not sure of their schedules, but to make this game up. So if they do play it, Luis Ortiz on the mound for the Pirates, uh, 6,800, no thank you. He's got a bad four-seamer, bad change. He's got a 12.5% strikeout rate with a an 11.5% walk rate and a 13.5% barrel rate in five, start, five starts this season, 55.5% strike one, no thanks. Not going anywhere near this. Um so I'd like to get to some Cubs if I can make it happen, if they play the game. It'd be some lefties, whoever they play, I don't really don't really care, because Ortiz still does have a slider, even though it's not a very good pitch. He's mostly throwing a sinker, and he's got a bad changeup, right? So um, lefties would be the preference, but you can play all these guys. Nico doesn't strike out. Talkman's a pretty good value play, 2,700. Say Suzuki's fine. Ian Happ, sure. Um, and really... Any of the other righties, like a Morell, Dansby Swanson, even a Patty Wisdom, who is striking out a 40% clip this season. Matt Mervis, for sure. Um, if you can make Cubs ha- Cub stacks happen, I think they're going to be totally off the board. Same thing with Pittsburgh getting Jameson Tyon, who has not been great. He was also bad in his last outing. We thought he was maybe trying to figure it out here, but uh, it's going to take some, some more starts to really smooth out this variance. I mean, he's been dreadful all season. Um, and he got picked apart in his last outing once again by the Angels, four earned in five and a third, struck out just five. So uh, he did have the one good outing against San Diego where he went five and two-thirds, only struck out three, though, and only gave up one run. So the suppression is not there, strikeout stuff is not there, and this is a difficult matchup, sneaky difficult, against Pirates, who against below-average right-handed pitching are very, very dangerous with some really high upside left-handed hitters, Brian Reynolds, uh, Carlos Santana has actually got a little bit of pop, and Jack Sawinski in particular. So if I were to get to anything here, it'd be just super deep tournament stuff with the weather. Like I said, they're probably going to cancel this game. I don't think we can get to this even in 20 max. Uh, maybe a one-off here or there if they play the game in 20 max, but mostly deep stacks in tournaments because what's likely to happen is all the moisture is going to get sucked out of the air from the storms that they got coming through. So if they play this game, you might have some wind blowing out, and nobody's going to be on this game. So you could see the baseball absolutely fly. Um, If they play the game, really pay attention to it. I think that's a very intriguing deep tournament stack. Both of these arms are very much attackable on the mound um, with some some offenses that can uh, get after them. So I think that's playable, but uh, it's most likely just going to get canceled. So we'll move on. Washington at Houston, not playing Patrick Corbin down here, 6,400 in this particular matchup. Uh, just no strikeout stuff against the right side of the plate, and they're going to go exceptionally right-handed heavy tonight. Uh, with Even without um, Jordan Alvarez, they're going to have eight righties in the lineup. So no thank you for, with Patrick Corbin here. Still giving up 35% hard contact and a 186 ISO against righties. 320 average allowed with a 370 Woba. It's all because of contact, because he's not walking anybody. 5.5% walk rate to the right side of the plate. 27% line drive rate. No thank you for Patty Corbin here tonight. I would like to get to some Houston. They're popping, you know, top five in value here so far. Uh, Mo Dubone, I think, is a pretty damn good play at the top of the lineup here. He's not going to strike out. He's going to make a lot of contact. Second base and outfield at 3,500. That's very playable. Josie Altuve, 46. Alex Bregman, 46 as well. Really like those top three guys there. Um, I don't want to play Jose Abreu because he stinks, but I think a Chaz McCormick, even a Jeremy Pena, it's still a slightly elevated price tag. Definitely, if he's in the seven hole of 4,500, elevated price tag. Uh, he's in play, though, because his problem is strikeouts, and Patty Corbin's not going to strike him out. And Corey Jolks. I think these are all playable pieces. Probably just going to stay off the Josie Abreu because he's totally washed, and Martin Maldonado because he doesn't have any upside. But I like Houston, for sure, getting after some Patrick Corbin. He's just going to pitch to way too much contact. We want line drive and fly ball hitters against Corbin because he's still inducing a lot of ground balls. Um, lefties or righties, like Kyle Tucker's in play. You know, I skipped over him, but he, he's certainly in play because he'll get to baseball on a line and still make some hard contact even against lefties and those that aren't going to strike him out. So um, I wouldn't leave him off the stacks by any means. If you get to some Houston, I think they're very much in play here. And you can play correlated teams with Hunter Brown at 10-5, 18%. I think I'd like to get up to some of this tonight. I think it's a pretty good matchup for him despite a 
being a very low strikeout matchup. Um, I think it's very much attackable. We like Hunter Brown against some pretty weak offenses, even though he's popped against uh, a really good offense here or there this season. He's going to be able to suppress a lot of production here tonight. He's got a very high ground ball rate, right? Certainly to the right side, 3.3 ground balls per fly ball to the right. He's no power, you know, buck 25 to, to both sides and ISO. Um, and a buck 50 ground ball to fly ball to the lefties as well. Now the line drive rates are slightly elevated here at uh, 21, 22%. Nothing terribly worrisome, but anything over 20%, we start to take note a little bit. Hard contact rates, though, are still very strong. And with such high ground ball rates and very low hard contact rates, that's a really good mixture, especially when the guy's got whiff stuff. 29% Ks to the left side, 27% Ks to the right side. So I like playing a good bit of Hunter Brown tonight if I can make it happen. He's 10-5 in the most expensive arm of the day. But a couple of these correlated pieces with Houston, like Josie Altuve, Alex Bregman, and Mo DeBone, like you can play those those price tags at 35, 46, and 46 with Hunter Brown, and you can still get to him and still a, a pretty equitable you know, uh, primary stack on the other side. So uh, I think Hunter Brown is very much in play despite a very low strikeout team, 19% uh, aggregate strikeout rate. They just don't hit for any power, buck 20, and they don't create at an 84 WRC+. plus. They don't walk at all, so they're just going to make contact, and it's not really all that good of contact. So um, I think he's a good spot for Hunter Brown, and I'm going to try and get as much of him as I can. And I'm probably... Eh, I'm not sure where, I, where I'll where i land, but I would guess if I built teams right now, that I'd come in, come in under on Scherzer and over on Hunter Brown. Um, okay. Don't really want anything to do with Houston or uh, the Nationals tonight, even in like leverage pieces or something. I'm just mostly just uh, pretty much off, unless like a 2300 Corey Dickerson or something like that. Okay, let's move on. Reds and Royals. Brandon Williamson on the mound. Now we got cheap price tags for both of these pitchers. Uh, Jordan Lyles going for the Royals. Um, 66 for Williamson. However, like this would make him playable. I, I don't think this is a very good matchup, though, uh, to be quite honest. Now he's taken apart some. Two bad teams, right? And that has kind of inflated his good numbers here. Um, I, I, any of the numbers that he has are that are good, they've been inflated by those two good outings at the Rockies when he made his debut. Rockies are dreadful against left-handed pitching, and Milwaukee against left-handed pitching is also dreadful. Um, however, he got taken apart by each of St. Louis, the Cubs, and the Dodgers pretty terribly there's no suppression there there's no strikeouts and I think this is kind of a sneaky bad matchup for him because Royals against left-handed pitching they'll create a little bit here at an 88 WRC plus not gonna wow us of course buck 50 ISO that's not gonna wow us but 35 percent hard contact kind of will with a 090 ground ball to fly ball that's an okay batted ball profile here with medium and you know medium plus and hard contact against the left side um, or left-handers. So I think that totally takes Brandon Williamson out of play here for me tonight at 6,600. I need him to strike out more guys, and I don't think this is the particular matchup that he's going to be able to do that. Now, they'll strike out at a you know, tick above average, 24%. So that might keep him in play. So that combination there of 6,600 and a slightly elevated K rate for the Royals, those are really the only intriguing numbers uh, that would put me on to Brandon Williamson here. But it's an 18% aggregate K rate with an 11% walk rate and a 13% barrel rate so far here in the early going in five stars for Williamson. So no thanks. I'm probably just going to stay off of it. Against right-handers, his changeup's been bad. His four-seamer's been bad. Cutter is keeping them off balance a little bit, but are they really off balance when he's still giving up a 366 Woba and a 294 ISO to the right side with 38% hard contact? I don't think so. So I'm going to stay off of this and maybe get to a couple Royals pieces. Unfortunately, they're still expensive with Salvi and, and Bobby Witt, 53 and 5,600 for those two guys. You can play a Michael Garcia or an Eddie Olivares for sure. Eddie Olivares, 2,600. I think this is a pretty good play here. Uh, Drew Waters or Matt Duffy, even a... Uh, a Darren Blanco at uh, 2,000 down at the bottom of the lineup. These are playable pieces if you get to full Royal stacks. I think we should see some offense here tonight because Jordan Lyles, yeah, we're absolutely going to go after him with the Reds here. Um, Reds are probably going to be popular, and guys like Ellie De La Cruz, they're still going to garner a crap load of ownership. Um, 
4700 starting to see the price tag really elevate on Ellie. And I, I think that's fine. It's like whatever. TJ Friedel is fine, 3900 Good value piece here leading off tonight. Matt McClain, fine at shortstop, too, because Jordan Lyles gives it up to both sides. We're not really scared about a platoon here. 279 average allowed to the left, or uh, ISO allowed to the lefties. 259 to the right-handers. 19%, 15.5% K rates, respectively. And hard contact rates north of 30% to both sides. We want mostly the lefties, because that's where he's far more attackable. Lyles, uh, 36% hard contact. And the higher ISO number, more fly balls. Um... But, you know, I guess not more fly balls. He's given up 055 ground balls per fly ball to the right side and 063 to the lefty. So, um, you know, like, all this is a, certainly attackable here. We could get to the Reds. They're going to be popular, though, and they're going to be a, a really kind of valuable filler stack here. Um, kind of awkward pricing, though, to make it happen. They're right in the mid-range price-wise. All of them are kind of in the mid to upper 4Ks, you know, a couple low 4k guys like a Friedel or a Tyler Stevenson, Spencer Steer, you know, right in the middle. Will Benson's cheap. Um, so you'd kind of have to find another middling type of stack price-wise in order to make that work and finagle some sort of shenanigans on the mound, I think. So it might be kind of a goofy construction here, but very much playable with like the Royal cheap Royals guys on the other side. And then two expensive arms or something like that. Um, plenty of constructions that you can get to with both teams here. I really like offense, no pitching in Kansas city for me tonight. Okay. Tampa and Oakland, Jalen beaks on the mound. I think he's just going to open two for the Rays. likely to just be a bullpen game. It's going to make Oakland hard to get to. We like them against lefties. And I think a couple of these guys, since they're still so cheap are very much in play. Still Siri Ruiz uh, against whenever he gets a left-hander really or or a below average right-hander too. He's he's in play certainly. Um, 3,400 still and playable price tag. Ramon Laureano still 2,600, very playable there. Price wise, Brent Rooker and Seth Brown playable price tags for those guys as well. 32 and 2,900 respectively. Uh, I'm not dealing with anybody in the five hole or lower for the Athletics here tonight. It's in Oakland and they get a bullpen game and they're a bad team. So um, if I get to anything, it'd just be the top four guys, and it's probably just going to be in, like, maybe a couple of mini stacks or just, like, one-off exposure, um, you know, with uh, any one of the four guys there, wherever they fit. But like I said, we can't really play Jalen Beeks here. It's just he's only going to go a couple innings, I think. Um, Hogan Harris on the mound for the A's. I'm not going to play him either because he gets Tampa once again. But we talked about this last night. These price tags for these starting pitchers, even if they're bad, like uh, James Caprillion, um, it, it could still be serviceable. You know, he gave up a late three-run bomb to Jose Siri, which really kind of tanked his outing. He would have been far better. He was hovering at 16, 18 points before that. Um, and that was a close ball game last night. So these price tags, there's upside for these starting pitchers, even in really bad matchups. I'm still not going to play Hogan Harris because I think Tampa is a little bit better against lefties than they are against righties. 152 WRC plus is just a stupid figure. 21% K rate, 244 ISO, 34% hard, neutral, buck 20 ground ball to fly ball. Very difficult lineup to get through here as well. You know, similar to Texas. So I'm not playing Hogan Harris here tonight. 19% um, strikeout rate, 14% walk rate here in, in his four appearances so far this season. Um, he's going to need to prove to me that he can he can pick through a, a good lineup like this. So I'd like to get to some Rays tonight. If I can, Yandy Diaz, 5,000, I think is a pretty damn good play here. Um, Harold Ramirez, really strong play. He'll be in the three-hole very likely. Wander should be back tonight. Just got a day off yesterday, 5,900. He's not cheap, but he's Wander. We don't really care about that. Randy Rosarena, 57, also not cheap, but we don't really care about that because he's Randy and he gets a lefty in a big ballpark, plays up his skill set a little bit. Excuse me. So, uh, Isaac Paredes, Jose Siri, Christian Bethencourt, all these guys hit lefties very, very well. Even Manny Margot, 2,500, he'll pop in value for you a little bit here today for Tampa. So, playable top to bottom for Tampa, uh, once again, it's kind of middling in value so far because of the guys that are expensive at the top of the lineup. That still means that they're very good, very potent offense. It's hard to stack teams in Oakland, though, because the ballpark is huge, and this game is in Oakland at night. So uh, no Hogan Harris for me, very little A's. Some Tampa where I can get there, but it's probably going to limit my exposure because I hate the ballpark. Okay, let's go to Philly and Arizona. I like this game again uh, for some offense, mostly from Philly, though, tonight. 
even though we liked both sides last night. JTR hit for the cycle last night. That was pretty sick. Um, Zach Wheeler on the mound for the Phils. 10-1, I like this. I mostly like the ownership here. I don't like the price tag going against or going after Arizona. They're still dangerous against even the best right-handers in baseball. They've got a lot of lefties over here that, that see the baseball pretty well um, against right-handers. Paven Smith, Cattell Marte, Corbin Carroll in particular. Josh Rojas didn't strike out a lot. Didn't have a lot of upside, but... Um, you know, a fine hit tool there. And they've got guys from the right side that have a little bit of power against righties, like a Christian Walker, Lord Escuriel. They did just activate their high upside catcher, um, Carson Kelly, last night. He might be out, and you'd very likely see a Gabby Moreno um, in there tonight. Probably going to stay off of either one of those guys, no matter. Because I like I like Wheeler here a little bit. Not a hell of a lot wrong here in the fundamental arsenal. Um... He's been far better than Nola, of course. And we're starting to round into Zach Wheeler form. There's a little bit of variance with him because this curveball has just been a horrible, horrible pitch. Wish he'd just totally get rid of it and focus on the three equitable pitches here with the four-seamer slider and the two-seamer. Um, but he's not going to walk people. He's going to stay off of the barrel and still induce some ground balls to the right side. So I don't want any of the righties here. 31% K rate, 088 ISO to the right side, 201 average allowed. No thank you. 269 average allowed to the lefties, however, with a 324 Wobe and a buck 50 ISO. So slightly more playable are some of these lefties, like a cheap Paven Smith at 3,300. He's got fly ball power in him, um, and he hits righties very well. They lead him off. He's unlikely to get pinch hit for Cattell Marte at 51. He'll hit from both sides. He's still fine, but expensive. And I don't really want to play him at second base necessarily in this particular matchup. Corbin Carroll, you could play against everybody. I think it's a fine spot for him because Wheeler's still going to give up an 080 ground ball to fly ball to the lefties. And Corbin Carroll is a neutral and good line drive hitter from the left side of the plate. Wheeler over here will give up a few line drives here or there with some hard contact to the lefties, 34%. Elevated line drive rate at 21% with a fly ball lean. So if we're going to play any lefties from Arizona here, it's going to be Paven Smith and a Corbin Carroll. Mostly Corbin Carroll, but Cattell Marte is also in play. Uh, Josh Rojas really don't like the price tag from him. So um, it, it'll be a one-off here or there because I'm very likely to get a good bit of leverage on the field here with Wheeler. He's sub-10% ownership right now, and I really like this a, a good bit. Um, I probably even prefer him to Hunter Brown tonight because I think the even though the, the matchups are equally as bad, I think Wheeler is, I mean, he's just a more established arm. So I'd probably prefer ownership considered to get to Wheeler as opposed to Hunter Brown, but kind of a wash fundamentally because Arizona's a good team and Washington doesn't strike out, right? So um, that's how I'd like to approach this. I want to play some of the Phillies again as well, go after Zach Davies. He's, he's dreadful. Uh, he pitches to way too much contact for me this season at a full 80%. He's been hurt, we get, so we got a, a short sample on him. Uh, but he's not going to strike anybody out. He's going to have trouble throwing strike one. We can't play him, definitely not, because Schwarber and Harper, it, at least against right-handers, they're far better than they are against lefties. They were frustrating last night in a very good spot against Tommy Henry. Zach Davies is going to blow it by these guys just as often as Tommy Henry. Um... And that's not all that often, right? 20% aggregate strikeout rate here. A little bit better against a right-hander, so that kind of takes me off of um, a little bit more Nick Castellanos, but he didn't strike out a whole hell of a lot. Trey Turner at 55, still elevated price tag for him. He's fine because you can always play Trey, but he's really struggling to find it this season. And you want to go right back to JTR after he hit for the cycle last night? Generally don't like chasing 45% games or whatever. But 4600 like you got a price drop. So, yeah, sign me up because Zach Davies isn't going to really wow him with stuff necessarily. Um, I would prefer mostly the lefties here, Schwarber and Harper, and throw in a Bryson Stott or Brandon Marsh, Cody Clemens or whatever. He hit a bomb last night. That's fine. I prefer the lefties, but you could you could full stack the Phillies once again here, and they are you know top third in, in value score once again and off the board really in ownership so far. So give me Philly and Wheeler almost exclusively. I'm going to mostly stay off of the D-backs here tonight. Okay, let's move on to Miami and Seattle. Eddie Cabrera on the mound. Kind of an elevated price tag here for Eddie. This is, ugh. Um, I mean, I know the strikeout stuff is good, right? And very high upside. Velo, he's got, you know, 96-plus in the tank. 
Hard, hard changeup. I really don't like. This is another fastball. This is a 93 mile an hour changeup. Like, are you kidding me? Um, so it's not really a change. It, it's like, ugh. I just don't like it. I think it's very, very fishy. Um, however, like, I, I think he's in play here against Seattle tonight. Um, 14% walk rate really takes me off because he had a 53% strike one rate. Like, what are we doing here? He's got good breaking stuff, good curveball, fine slider. Um, and it's really the velo and the equitable sort of fastball slash changeup mix that, that keeps him serviceable. Um, so I think he's in play. 9,600, I'm really not thrilled about this price tag, but I really do like the ownership. And I think that puts him in play because he's got very, very high upside. If you want to go after him, I think we can play mostly the righties here, as a matter of fact. It's not the lefties. Um, he's given up 45% hard contact to the right side of the plate, buck 61 ground ball to fly ball, which is fine when he's given up a lot of hard contact, but anything north of 40% is, uh, worrisome no matter how many ground balls you're getting. So I think if you're going to play anybody from Seattle, get off of, um, some of this Eddie Cabrera over here. Not like you really need to play Seattle. Like you don't get a lot of leverage on it. Uh, you can play some. You can always play Julio, of course, and you can play Tay Oscar at 3,300. He's going to strike out a crap load in this matchup. I'd probably prefer getting to a Ty France, I think. Not jacked about a 3,900, but these right-handers starting to see the baseball a little bit. Cal Raleigh, I think, is fine from the left side, as is Jared Kelnick, of course, at 4,400. So you could you could convince me that a, uh, a Seattle stack is in play here. We saw what they did. It's not like they can't score. Um, and put up crooked numbers and hit the baseball over the wall in Seattle like they did it last night, hit like three bombs or whatever it was. So I think they're in play, but they're well down the list in in terms of value and certainly in ownership. So if you want to get to a couple of Seattle pieces, I think they're a really good late and night, night's late play. Um, as is Eddie Cabrera. I think he's excellent on the, on the night slate. But I think he's damn good on the main slate, too, at sub-10% ownership, given this upside, because Seattle strikes out a 25% clip against right-handers, and they're a below-average creation offense against righties, just a buck 52 ISO. Neutral ground ball to fly ball with some line drives at 20%, 33% hard. It's kind of average here. Um, so an average offense in what I would consider a, a below-average matchup, it's the walk rate and the strike one rate that really have me concerned with Eddie. So... At 9,600, that's where I balk, but I really do like the ownership here, and um, I'm going to try and get to a little bit Eddie. I think there's very high upside for him in sort of a late-night pitcher hammer. George Kirby on the other side, I'd, I'd rather just play him, right, if I had to choose. Of course, he's 300 cheaper, and he doesn't have near the control problems. Like, when you're walking 12% fewer hitters than, than your opposing starter, I mean, you're going to put yourself in a pretty good position position to win 70 percent strike one here 34 percent chase it's the it's the swing strike rate that really leaves it on the table for kirby he throws so many strikes he's right over the damn plate 83 percent contact rate that puts some of miami in play i guess like a jorge soler in particular from the right side george kirby still going to give up a little bit of production because he throws to so much contact here 279 average allowed to the lefties 253 to the righties little bit of power, buck 65 ISO to left-handers, 120 to right-handers. So we don't really want to go there necessarily, but Jorge Soler is fine. Um, he could take apart any righty in baseball. It's a soft contact rate against right-handers that I really want to stay off of, or that really makes me want to stay off of the Marlins. It's 23% here versus a 28% hard contact rate for Kirby. Really, really good numbers against the right side. It's lefties, if anybody, if I want to... Um, play some some Marlins against his 15% ownership. But I don't particularly want to do that with Luis Arise um, at 4,900. I love the guy, but I, you just can't play him in tournaments on 14. You can't even play him in cash, I don't think, on 14-game slates. Uh, it's really, really hard to get to. Jesus Sanchez, 3,300. I think that's a pretty decent price-adjusted play if you want to get there. But uh, it's mostly just Kirby here for me. I, I think 9,300 is another one of these 9K guys that I think we can get to today, and and I like the 15 sub 15 percent ownership projection value score. All of it, all of it's great with Kirby. Um, the only worry is being able to generate CSW here at, at just sub 27 percent. He pitches to a lot of contact because he throws so many strikes. He needs to generate more chase with the changeup and a slider. He needs to improve the value of these pitches. 
and if he can do that in the future, that would make him a you know top of the line starter in baseball. But um, you know, similar to like an early career Shane Bieber. So mostly just Seattle here tonight, but mostly just pitching in this game. Um, I like both Kirby and Eddie Cabrera. Okay, let's move on to last couple games of the night. Cleveland, San Diego, Tanner Bybee. I think I'd like to try and get to a little bit of him tonight. Um, but I don't know. It's like this strike one rate, 56% here. Kind of has me a little bit worried. He's only got 25% chase and a sub 10% swinging strike rate himself. 27% CSW is not all that impressive. Against San Diego, we really need guys that can throw it past these dudes. And 24% strikeout rate, yeah, that's high for a, a team aggregate. But still, a 12% walk rate, that's mostly because of Juan Soto. And he's 40% walk rate, or whatever the hell it is. 92 WRC+, plus, they don't create because they don't steal bases. But Soto's got speed. Tatis, of course, has speed. Um, you know, Machado, Gary Sanchez, Cronenworth, these guys aren't going to run or whatever. So they're going to mostly try and hit the baseball over the wall. But they haven't been able to do it so far this year. Manny Machado heating up probably a little bit. Gary Sanchez, he's been great since he came over to, came over to San Diego. Tatis is Tatis. Soto is Soto. So you can play everybody here. Jake Cronenworth really heating up. It kind of happens with him. He's a very streaky hitter. I know the average is not there for him yet this season. But uh, it kind of happens with him. He goes to Coors Field, and you know the, the altitude just solves every problem for him, and he really starts seeing the baseball. So he's a streaky hitter. When he gets going, this is a good, good hitter. Um, 4,200 first and second base eligible there. I think he's probably my favorite play from the Padres here tonight going after Bybee, if I'm going to do that. But I don't really want to do that necessarily. I still respect Bybee. If I'm going to do it, it's probably going to be with a Soto Cronenworth and a, like a Tatis team or something like that. Um, don't really want to play Manny in this matchup at 4,900. Don't really want to play Gary Sanchez, 3,700. But it's a playable five-man if you get there. More of a late slate play, getting after full stacks of the Padres, I think. They're pretty far down the list. So that's kind of why I'd like to get to a little bit of Bybee if I can. But uh, not super jacked about doing it, to be quite honest. It's mostly the price tag and the ownership that are um, catching my eye here a little bit. But the underlying metrics in this matchup are like, eh, I'm kind of lukewarm on it. So we'll see where I come in with it. Joe Musgrove on the other side, I'd rather play him, but I don't really want to play him all that much either. Um, I mean, I don't think Musgrove's all that good. However, we mentioned in his last few starts that he is a streaky, streaky arm. When he really starts seeing it and feeling the baseball, he can really take apart a lot of teams, and he's streaking right now. Very good in his last three starts. Um, strikeout stuff is up and down still sometimes. But he can still go a K or a K plus an inning. He took apart Seattle really good, struck out eight and in five innings, and just gave up one run. Went six and a third against the Yankees, six against Miami, with six Ks, three Ks respectively in those starts, and one earned and zero earned in those starts respectively as well. So I think that makes him serviceable at 7,800. It's a playable price tag, playable projection, playable ownership here, and playable value score, of course. Um, he's got underlying metrics that are... A little fishy, right? Not a lot of value. He throws so much junk. He throws a ton of pitches. And it's hard for us to glean value out of that in small samples. And he's still got one sample here uh, from the Mexico City start that is really dragging all of these numbers down. That said, Musgrove is really up and down. He's a highly variant pitcher. But like I said, when he's streaking, you want to jump on board at good price tags. And this is a good, good suppression matchup because Cleveland is terrible. They're heating up a little bit. They've been seeing the baseball a little bit better. 86 WRC plus now against righties so far this season. Still no power, but they're creating a little bit more and getting on base and stealing. Um, and they're still going to make a lot of contact. 19% strikeout rate for them as a team. Buck 30 ground ball to fly ball is not encouraging, so I'd kind of like to play a good bit of Joe Musgrove in that respect. But um, you know, we'll see where I come in with it. I think he's playable. He's just not all that thrilling for me, but I think he's a very good suppression matchup for him, so I'll probably end up with a, a good bit when we get down to lock. So mostly just pitching here for me in this game tonight. I don't want any Cleveland. I, I just don't want to deal with them on a 14-game slate. I don't care if they're cheap. Uh, whatever, like one guy is going to hit a ball out. Now, 4,800 for Josie Ramirez. He's really starting to see the baseball again. Power is starting to return. Hopefully that continues. And if you want to get off of some of this 16 to 20% ownership, on um, Joe Musgrove, I think Josie, he's definitely the one I'd play. 
You want to play uh, Andres Jimenez, second base, okay, 3,600, whatever. Stephen Kwan, okay, he's not going to strike out a lot, 38. Or Josh Naylor, whatever, at 3,600. I mean, it's fine, but mostly a late slate play there. I don't want to play them on a main slate. Super difficult to get there with them. So mostly just pitching here. Okay, White Sox Dodgers, um, no pitching here for me. I don't want anything to do with Lance Lynn. I think he's going to get bludgeoned by some of these lefties here tonight. However, it's going to be super difficult to get to some of the Dodgers. I mean, Freddie Freeman is finally 6,300, but unfortunately, he's freaking 6,300. How are you going to pay for this um, and play some expensive arms in the upper 9K range tonight? Like, you can't play Mookie and Will Smith and J.D. Martinez and Max. You can't five-stack the Dodgers here and play anybody on the mound that you're comfortable with. So that's going to keep their ownership down. Every one of these guys is mega, mega expensive. And the righties, I don't really want them anyway. Lance Lynn's always been very good against right-handers. This season, he's getting torched by lefties. 43% hard, 467 Woba with a 340 ISO against the left side of the plate. 362 average allowed, 21% K rate. Like 43% hard is out of control bad. Three and a half homers per nine. And we got full 13 starts on Lance Lynn here. Yeah, the... Probably a little noisy here, but 080 ground ball to fly ball. There's fly balls. There's hard contact. I, there's barrels against the left side. I want to play some lefties if I can make it happen, and it's got to just be yeah, price adjusted. Max Muncy at 5,000 flat. I don't really want to play David Peralta, but this is a very high upside spot for anybody standing on the left side of the plate. Um, Jason Hayward, I think, is a little bit more intriguing for me at 2,500 as opposed to Peralta 27, and you're going to have to play one or probably even two of these guys to make a Dodger stack happen. Because, man, you, you really want to play Will Smith at 6,000 or 65 for d freaking Mookie Betts? I love Freddie Freeman, don't get me wrong. He should be above 6,000 every single day. That's what kind of hitter this guy is. He's a top five hitter in baseball. But my goodness, it's very difficult to get there on a full 14-game slate. Um, but that's going to keep their ownership down, and... Despite these very high price tags, they're still popping in the top third in value, even when everybody's above 5,500. Like, it's it's insane how powerful this offense can be and how highly they project every single night. So I don't want anything to do with Lance Lynn, even against these righties, against whom he's very good. It, it, like, you got to get through Mookie, who doesn't strike out a lot, and Will Smith, who doesn't strike out at all, and J.D. Martinez, who's really seeing the baseball again. So... Um, no thanks on Lance Lynn. Tony Gonsolin, same with him. He's just not going deep enough into games in 40 and two-thirds this season, just five innings per. I don't want to deal with this. I don't think he's got all that big of a leash. He's only throwing 80 pitches a start. Like, let the damn guy throw pitches. Unfortunately, like, he still can't realize a strikeout rate at 18%. Um, like, I'm just not interested in Tony Gonsolin. 8,200, I think he's overpriced here, and... I just don't want to deal with it against a pretty low strikeout team in the White Sox. 23% uh, aggregate K rate. 82 WRC plus is intriguing for any opposing pitcher, but I don't want to deal with that. I think this offense stinks. Um, so I, but I still don't want to play Gonsolin because he's not going to go that deep into the game. If you want to get to some White Sox stacks, I think that's viable because the Dodgers bullpen has been terrible all season. Um but that's pretty much it. I don't really want to play any of these guys. I think price adjusted, it'd be like a uh, Yohan Moncada, 3,400, uh, or you know maybe Tim Anderson. He's fine, 4,400, makes a lot of contact. But outside of that, I'm really not enthused about playing 4,900 Luis Robert here tonight. So um, would that put Gonsolin in play? I mean, I guess at very low ownership, but like he's just not going to go deep enough at this price tag. So I'm not super interested there. Um, so mostly just the Dodgers here, maybe a one-off of. You you want Moncada, but no Lance Lynn for sure. Uh, okay, so that's it for the breakdown. I know we went kind of long here, but we got 18,000 games to go over. Uh, keep an eye out for who Texas announces today. That might put you onto some Angel stacks. Um, let's start with uh, Toronto and Baltimore in a review here. I don't want to play with Chris Bassett tonight. I think there's other guys I'd rather play. I don't want to play Dean Kramer either. Give me some Baltimore short stacks probably. In Toronto, you can make short stacks or full stacks happen. It's it's mostly just price tags here that are going to prevent that. Uh, Yankees, Mets, you want to play some leverage stacks against Scherzer? Yeah, he gives up homers. Go ahead. Um, I don't think it's all that great, though, to be honest. And I really don't want to play the Mets because they're terrible. This game's at City Field. So Scherzer, yeah, probably just staying off of the Severino. I want to see more from him. Colorado and Boston, maybe a couple Colorado pieces. Ryan McMahon and Nolan Jones in particular. Cutter Crawford, no thank you. Um, even against a, a pretty poor 
production team in the Rockies. Um, they still hit a lot of line drives and hit pretty decently. They don't strike out a lot from the right side, or against righties, that is. Uh, Boston, yeah, sure, but I'm kind of off of them tonight. If I had to choose, it'd be a righty here tonight rather than all of these lefties. Yeah, you can always play Devers. Uh, you can always play Yoshida or, you know, whatever. Jaron Duran, 36, leading off is fine. But uh, I'm mostly off of full stacks of the Boston Red Sox tonight because I really respect the cutter and the changeup from Chase Anderson. So give me a Justin Turner, I guess. Uh, Milwaukee and Minnesota, I don't really want any Milwaukee here tonight. I like Pablo. I like Corbin Burns a pretty good bit. He's probably going to be my preferred pivot off of Scherzer. Um, him and you know Kirby maybe later. But uh, I like Pablo as well. He's 1100 cheaper than Burns. And I think the matchups for both of these guys here uh, are very equitable against the lineups that these two teams are likely to roll out against them. San Francisco, St. Louis, Alex Cobb, I think he's in play. I'm not super jacked about the price in this particular matchup. Flaherty is also in play, even though I can't stand the guy. Um, but he's in play. Like both of these pitchers are. I'm kind of off of offense for the most part. Outside of the Giants, you know, Flaherty has walk problems, and these guys hit the baseball over the wall. So if you start walking three guys and give up a – you know, a meatball to Jock Peterson or to Michael Conforto, it's all of a sudden 5 nothing, and, you know, Flaherty is cooked. So um, I think that makes the Giants an intriguing stack here. As I mentioned, keep an eye out for what the Angels do against Texas tonight and what Texas does against the Angels. No Jaime Berea for me. Uh, I want Texas as much as I can get pretty much every night. Pittsburgh, Chicago, game's going to get canceled. If it doesn't, give me stacks, though. If you can make it happen, I think both of these arms are super attackable. And there's a lot of upside um, if all the moisture in the air is gone and, you know, creating less drag on the baseball. Washington, Houston, no Washington at all for me tonight. Just Houston and some Hunter Brown. Um, mostly short Houston stacks because the bottom half of the lineup kind of stinks. But I like the price tags of the top three guys. It's going to increase their ownership, though, for sure. Since he and KC, offense only. No pitching here for me. No Jordan Lyles. No Brandon Williamson. I really like offense here. I think you could see uh, some crooked numbers from both sides of the plate. Tampa and Oakland. Uh, I like Tampa a little bit more here tonight against Hogan Harris than I did last night. Their right-handers are very equitable against left-handed pitching. No Oakland. I mean, I guess I'll have pieces here or there. Um, but this is a bullpen game for Tampa, and they're just going to pick apart Oakland. You know, they may throw a freaking no-hitter, a bullpen no-hitter tonight against Oakland. They, this offense is awful. Philly and Arizona. I like Philly again tonight, and I like uh, Zach Wheeler. I don't want anything to do with Zach Davies, and since I like Zach Wheeler a lot, really don't want all that much of Arizona, probably some Corbin Carroll, and maybe that's it. I don't know. A good bit of Philly, though, if I could make it happen. Miami, Seattle, um, mostly just pitching here. Kirby and Eddie Cabrera, like both of these arms in tournaments at lower ownership. Good upside spots, I think, for them. If you want to get to some Seattle against Eddie, I think that's okay. He gives up a lot of hard contact there, and he's got walk problems. Cleveland, San Diego, no Cleveland for me on the main. Tanner Bybee, maybe if I can get there. Joe Musgrove, sure. Um because Cleveland is dreadful. San Diego, yeah, sure. I like Jake Cronenworth a good bit, and I like Soto and Tatis, of course. And White Sox, Dodgers, mostly just the Dodgers, if I can make it happen, but they are egregiously exp expensive. Um, Yoan Moncada is probably my favorite White Sox play here. Uh, okay, so that's it. Keep an eye out for projections and ownership updates, as always, and good luck to everybody on this huge 14-game Tuesday.